This is the lesson for Ancient and Medieval History for Tuesday, the 5th of October, 2021. We are doing creation myths, and we forgot, well, I, first person singular, I forgot one yesterday. So we are going to the Shona myth, which is myth number 19. Uh, let's see. Need a volunteer or a drafty? I'd rather have a volunteer. Somebody who wishes to come up and read this poetical creation myth. Thank you. And remember, your job is to listen attentively. There'll be a quiz on these soon. What? 19. Shona. Yes. Yes. Great spirit, piler up of the rocks into towering mountains when you stamp on the stone. The dust rises and fills the land, hardness of the precipice, the waters of the, the pool that turn into misty rain when stirred, vessels overflowing with oil. Father of Runji. Runji, who sews the heavens like cloth, may you knit together that is which below, color forth of the branching trees, bring forth the shoots that they stand erect. You have filled the land with mankind. The dust rises on high, O Lord. Well, wonderful one, you live in the midst of the sheltering rocks. You give rain you give rain to mankind. We pray to you, hear us, Lord. You are high with you are on high with the spirits of the great. You raise the grass covered hills above the earth and create the rivers. Gracious one. Thank you. The Shona are a tribal people of eastern Zimbabwe, what used to be southern Rhodesia. They are an African tribe, sub-Saharan Africa, in an area just north of South Africa. This prayer is in the form of a grateful appreciation of what the Great Spirit has, has provided. And it lists out many fine things in creation and attributes all of them to the creative spirit that they are worshiping. So here is a list of the created objects, or many of them, and um, a, sen a sense of thank you, Lord. The, the, one of the Islamic myths had a similar feel where you were listing uh, or where the uh, the myth was listing a bunch of things in creation and giving thanks for them. And the proper attitude towards uh, the divine when you are in worship for creation is to be grateful. The world really is a wonderful place. If you, from a scientific perspective, look at the other worlds of our solar system, if you can imagine what other worlds beyond our solar system would be like. Not only are we in the habitable range uh, for life like us, the range that has liquid water naturally occurring on the surface, but we have an atmosphere that's baby bears just right. It's not so thin that it lets heat and uh, pressure escape like Mars. It's uh, thick enough to have uh, proper ozone layer and other layers protecting us from, cos uh, from cosmic radiation. Uh, but it's not too thick so as to create the kind of crushing pressure that would impulpify a person were they to stand on the surface of Venus in street clothes. Uh, Venus is the closest thing to cosmological hell as you want to imagine. I can imagine the that human beings could eventually go to and even leave bases or colonies on most of the rocky bodies within our solar system. Even the uh, dark side of Mercury, but not Venus. I could see us colonizing the upper layers of gas giants with floating cities before we would go there because it is so high pressure. So our world is a world that is filled with life. And if you know what you're doing, it's capable for human beings to settle almost everywhere. We've got human beings in the Arctic, the Inuit peoples, the Eskimos. We've got human beings in the deserts, the Bedou, the Arabians. 
We've got human beings in the jungles, the pygmies, and the other Central African tribes. We've got human beings on the plains. We've got human beings that are land-oriented, horse-oriented, sea-oriented. Because our world is so full of life, so full of possibilities. And there is this sense that even today, modern materialists take it for granted. There's a saying up here by a French Maquis fighter who uh, fought against the Nazis when they occupied France during World War II, that freedom is something you cannot appreciate until you've lost it. I don't remember exactly, but I think it's somewhere over there. Excellent. Thank you. You cannot appreciate freedom until you've lost it. <coughs> Try to imagine how hard it would be to live anywhere else other than here. You know what the most dangerous type of world might be? A world that seems like a garden planet. A world that seems like ours. Can anyone guess why a Gaia world, a garden planet, a Class M world, like ours might actually be more dangerous than the hot surface of Mercury or one of the moons of Jupiter like Io or um, Ganymede. What would be dangerous in a world that was so like ours? Want to take a shot? Would it be that it's like prone to disaster that it can fail at any moment? Well, there's that, although the, the, the societal structure that we have is fairly fragile. The, the biological structure that it's based on is actually pretty tough. Our, our you know, environmentalists overemphasize the fragility of the ecosystem. The ecosystem actually can take a punch. Yeah? Uh, the organisms and bacteria and diseases on it? Exactly. We would face a reversed war of the world situation. We go to a planet like ours, but that isn't ours. A planet that has all sorts of bacteria and diseases, but that we have no immunities to. And it could be oh so bad. So, and that's something science fiction never deals with in Star Trek. They beam down to planets in shirt sleeves all the time. Ah, the air is breathable. Everything's fine. No! No! Zzz. Little, little, you know, microscopic creatures going and targeting this, these, these meat sacks. Now, it's possible that we would, we would be different enough so that the diseases wouldn't affect us at all, that we'd sort of miss one another, but you never know. Uh, so the world around us, the fact that we are adapted to it, and it, to us, is a wonderful thing. And again, it's one of the many things that make me not a believer in completely random evolution. I do not think you roll the dice and you get us or the world. I, I just don't. You, you may disagree. Okay, we have one, two, three, four, five, six myths left. I hope to do them all today. So, number 21, the first Greek myth. Who will read? Somebody different. That's a nice myth. Thank you. Whenever you're ready. Okay. First of all, the voice chaos came into being. Next, broad bosomed earth, the solid and eternal home of all, and Eros desire, the most beautiful of all immortal gods, who in every man and every god soft softens the sinews yeah. and overpowers the prudent purpose of the mind. Out of void came darkness and black night. Out of night came light and day. Her children conceived after union and love with darkness. Earth first, earth first produced starry sky equal in size with herself to cover her, to cover he on all sides. Next, she produced the tall mountains, the pleasant haunts of the gods, and also gave birth to the barren waters, sea with its raging surges. All this without the passion of love. Thereafter, the lay. Thereafter, she lay with sky, gave birth to ocean with its deep. Birth. Excellent. Thank you. By the way, since I just pick people, sometimes it is possible that some of you may have, you know. 
do not photograph, do not uh, record orders, or there may be something else going on in your world. If, if it's something like that, please come and let me know so that I don't put you in a bad position. Uh, because I don't want to put you in a bad position. At the same time, I do want people to come up. So this Greek myth talks about the role that desire plays in creation. And ultimately, when uh, the earth lies with the sky, um, there is going to be desire, sexual union, production of the gods, uh, the ancestors of the Titans, and then the Titans, and so forth. But chaos is at the beginning. And chaos is similar to the Chinese notion of this sort of cosmic soup where everything is blended together and nothing is real. It's just this, this amorphous potentiality for everything. And out of chaos, the earth forms and desire forms, and then darkness and light comes from darkness uh, and so forth. But the role that desire plays in creation and the fact that everything originates in chaos. Now we have urinomy, not urinome, urinomy and ophia. Would anyone like to uh, come up? I'd like two people. Yeah, no, one person should be able to do this. Please. But it's urinomy. Urinomy. Your, I, not me, no me. And ophia. Whenever you're ready. In the beginning was chaos and darkness. Chaos was a great vast sea in which all elements were mixed together without form. Out of this sea rose your, your enemy, not of the good thing, in the great, goddess, the great goddess of all things. She emerged from the waves naked and began to dance on the sea, as there was nothing for, for her, form for her to stand on. Suddenly, the south wind blew and spun her around. It is said that the north wind has miraculous fertility powers, and when she spun around, your your enemy. Your enemy grasped at the north wind. The great serpent of the waters, Ophion, saw your, your enemy dancing and was filled with desire. He made love to her immediately. She then assumed the form of a lovely bird and gave birth to the great universal egg. Ophion co coiled his tail around the egg until it cracked, spilling out creatures all over the new, newly formed earth. Your enemy loved Ophion for a long time, and they went to live on Mount Olympus, home of the gods. However, Ophion became obnoxious and tiresome, bragging about he had fathered all living things. Eurynome grew weary, weary of him and bruised his head with her heel. Compare this with the same phrase in the Genesis story of creation. He was then cast down to the dark regions of the earth. Thank you. So, this is a matriarchal creation. Early in Greek history, uh, we're talking the Minoan Cretans and maybe the Mycenaeans, maybe even some early Greek kingdoms of the Hellenic period. Early in Greek history, there were some areas that were matriarchal, and that's a rarity. Matriarchies are rare in history because women tend to be smaller and less aggressive uh, than men, um, and for a variety of other reasons, like the need for protection and uh, the nurturing urge, and all the other male-female stuff. But in these matriarchies, there is a ruling queen, and every year she marries a harvest king, and the harvest king is her lover for that year, and then he is sacrificed at harvest tide, uh, blood sacrifice, blood rite sacrifice, to um, assure a good harvest in the following year. There's even an echo of this in the Odyssey, which we'll be talking about, whereby... Odysseus leaves his wife Penelope in charge, and the suitors who want to take Odysseus's place all act as if all they have to do is marry Penelope, and the royalty will then be conferred onto them, regardless of Telemachus. I mean, it's just, it, there's an echo of it. So here we have the goddess, a primal goddess, Eurynome, dancing. And the wind, uh, you know, attracts her, her ardor, and, and they, they make love. And Ophion comes, serpent, male, you get it. And uh, they make love, and they produce the cosmic egg. What is Ophion's crime? He bragged 
that this is his kids. He bragged that this is his work. But Eurynome is the primary goddess. And this is a matriarchal thing, so the female must be supreme to the male. So what does she do? She goes, oh, old Fionn, you just don't understand. Thwack! And she crushes his head with her heel, or at least bruises it. And either he goes, you know, slithering away and has to then, you know, hide. Um, because he was arrogant enough to claim co-parentage with this goddess Eurynome. So here we have some of the problems between men and women that uh, was also illustrated in the Lilith story of the Jews, where there's this question for dominance. Most societies do not waste their time or occupy themselves trying to figure out whether boys and girls are better. The truth is you need both. Our society is one of the rare ones that really wrangles over this stuff in the name of equality, whatever that means. And um, so today, it's not that unusual for us to imagine a female goddess objecting to a male uh, trying to assert dominance or dominion or control or whatever. Um, the Greeks are good at pointing out the difficulties <laughs> between men and women. Now we've got Gaia and Uranus, very short one. If you don't like to read, this would be a good one to volunteer for. Damn. Not that I'm saying you don't like to read. You just have to think. Gaia, Mother Earth, emerge out of chaos and then bore her son. Uranus, which means heaven or sky, while she was sleeping, when Uranus, when Uranus uh, ascended to his place in the heavens, he showed his gratitude on his mother in the form of rain, which fertilized the earth and all the dormant seeds within her come to life. Thank you. So here we have chaos producing Gaia, Mother Earth. Gaia, Mother Earth, gives birth to Uranus, Father Sky, in so many words. Uranus, then, it's, it's, it's Greek, just accept it. And they're gods, and it's the beginning of creation. It's not like there are many choices around. Uranus then fertilizes his mother. So there's some, what we would call, incestuous relations. And from those incestuous relations come many, many things. So what we have here is a uh, section, you know, chaos, Gaia, Uranus, and then we have fertility and seeds. Now we have what here is called the birth of the gods. Uh, it's both Oedipal and patriarchal, so it's different. Um, and Oedipal does mean son, mother, stuff. So, uh, can I have a couple of people, please, uh, to split the load on this? Okay, let's see. Mr. Kennedy, and in the corner. Yes. Okay. I will have you read the first and third paragraphs, mm -hmm. and uh, you can actually start with that little partial paragraph. And you can read the second and fourth paragraphs. Okay. In the beginning, there was only Gaia, the earth, and the great sea of chaos. Out of chaos came night and Erebus, darkness. From the night came the ethers, or upper atmosphere, and day. The earth produced the sea, then the great ocean, and other children, including the Titans. Hyperion, the sun, he who flies over. Rhea. Menesomosine, that's okay. That's that's tough. Yeah. Menesomosine. Oh, Christ. I used to be able to say this. Menesomosine. Uh, Menesomosine. Memory. Phoebe, the moon, the shining one. And at last, Cronus. The children of Gaia, the earth, were fathered by Uranus, the sky. Uranus became jealous of the affection that Gaia had for her children and sought to destroy them. First, he hid them deep inside her in a cavern. She was tired of Uranus' Uranus's jealousy, and as her children grew, they caused her great pain. 
The youngest of these children, Cronus, decided to take revenge on his cruel, cruel father. Erp took Cronus into her bed with a sickle in his hand. When Uranus came to sleep with Gaia, Cronus castrated his father and flung the parts into the sea where they sired Aphrodite, the goddess of love, who emerged from the fertile sea foam. Uh, the blood poured out over the earth, giving life to the Furies, the Avengers who meet out justice. Cronus was now master of the gods. They married Rhea, or maybe Rhea. Their children were Hestia, god of the hearth, Demeter, goddess of agriculture, Hera, goddess of childbirth, Ares, god of war, and lastly, Zeus. Cronus, jealous of the attention Rhea gave her children, swallowed them all whole, except Zeus, whom Rhea sent to Crete for safekeeping. She deceived Cronus into swallowing a stone that he believed to be Zeus. Like her mother, Rhea conspired with her son to take revenge upon her cruel husband, for Rhea knew that it would be Zeus who would overthrow his father and become king of the gods. Zeus remained in a cave where he was nourished by the goat Almalthia and fed by the honey of wild bees. He grew to manhood in just a few short years, at which time Cronus vomited up all of the swallowed children, as well as the stone. The stone was placed by Zeus at Delphi, where the oracle of the god Apollo was located. Cronus was killed. For ten years, Zeus and his brothers battled against their uncles, the Titans, for mastery of the universe. Finally, um, with the Titans vanished, Zeus set up his course on court on the Mount Olympus as an uncontested master of the gods. Thank you both. Good job. So here we have quite a story. The Greeks are not only good at talking about the difficulties between men and women that exist sometimes, but also about the difficulties between the generations. Old people don't necessarily understand young people. Neither do young people always understand old people. There are cleavages in society. There are divisions. Male, female, old, and young are some basic ones. So in these myths, the Greek, who's the Greeks, whose Olympian gods and Titan, their Titan ancestors, are very, very human. It makes total sense that the difficulties between men and women, between old and young, would come out in these stories. So once again, you have Gaia and Uranus coming together and giving birth to the Titans. But Gaia doesn't like the fact that Uranus is a jerk. He's sort of domineering and obnoxious. So she conspires with her son to do something awful to Uranus. That awful thing may produce the goddess of uh, love, Aphrodite, but still. Ah! So... Now what? Well, the same thing's going to play out. The same thing. Kronos marries his sister Rhea. They have a bunch of children. But then Kronos gets jealous of the attention that mommy pays to the children, not enough attention being paid to Kronos. So he decides to lash out at his children. She conspires with Zeus to keep Zeus out of Kronos' gullet. And then finally Zeus... Uh, returns after growing up on Crete, where nobody would go because it's Crete, I guess. And uh, Zeus leads the, his generation in a war against his parents' generation, the war of the Olympian gods versus the Titans, <clears throat> which Kronos loses and the Titans lose. And they are, they are banished or, or defeated. They're not destroyed, uh, but they're no longer the active chief gods. That's Zeus and Hera, and Demeter, and Testia, and Ares, and uh, Hermes, and Vulcan, and not Vulcan, uh, Hephaestus, and all of that. The Olympian gods that you are, if you're not already familiar with, you will be when you encounter the Iliad and the Odyssey. So, get a sense that this myth is about the troubles between generations. And some pretty nasty stuff. Okay. Oh, how silly these myths are. These pre-industrial myths compared to our science. Our science triumphs over the superstitions of olden times. Ladies, gentlemen, if you understand the experimental science over the generations that has led us to the current theories. If you know the math, 
if you understand the exceptions. In other words, if you comprehend the science in its detail, then it is actually what the word scientas means, which is knowledge. Scientas, science, means knowledge. However, you know what most people do? They take it on faith. Yep, bunch of experts in white coats with PhDs after their names who've done a bunch of experiments say that the science says this. And people go, oh, experts, experts, experts. And suddenly we have a bunch of people believing in science superstitiously. Stevie Wonder once sang in the song, Superstition, when you believe in things that you don't understand, then you'll suffer. Most people who extol the theories of science don't understand the science. They take it on faith. Therefore, it is a faith as much as anything else. And what's funny, in an ironic way, is that since science is not a doctrine of truth, but is rather a methodology of provisional theory, eventually almost every theory changes, is modified, morphs out of all recognition to what it used to be. Yes, the sciences that you learn today will be laughed at generations from now as silly. Just as some people today laugh at the theories of continental drift and the rise and fall of continents that used to be uh, believed in by geologists, and then simple continental drift, and now we have what is known as plate tectonics in geology. All of this stuff will be superseded or better understood if we continue developing our knowledge. And the same is true of physics, of astronomy, of biology, of all the sciences. That which we think we understand, we understand to a point, and a good scientist understands that the real undiscovered country, the voyage of discovery that is yet to be made, is in pushing back the current boundaries of understanding to learn more. What mysteries exist in science now? Well, in astronomy, there are questions of dark energy and dark matter. In physics, there is the limitations of quantum mechanics that we've been grappling with for the last 30 years or so, as string theory struggles to be born, but string theory may not be born. It may ultimately be a dead end, or, or maybe there's just something that we don't understand that could bring things together in a general field theory that deals with the biggest of things and the smallest of things. Because electromagnetism doesn't act like the other primal forces. Biolo biologically, we are just beginning really to understand DNA and the brain. I say beginning because there are complexities that we don't understand. In the end, science, if it progresses, is going to take all of these comfortable ideas that you grew up with, that I grew up with, and change them in some way. I'm saying this because a lot of people view science as the truth. That isn't what it deals in. It's not its purpose. Here we have from Charles Darwin's book, The Origin of Species. And since biological evolution is one of the creation myths of our society, a myth that most people tend to believe in one form or another, it would behoove us to take a look. This is from the end of his book, as he's summoning things up. And I'm going to read it because I want to read it with certain emphasis. Please read along with, take notes as necessary. It is interesting to contemplate a tangled brook bank, clothed with many plant, plants of many kinds with birds singing on the bushes, with various insects flitting about, and with worms crawling through the damp earth. And to reflect that these elaborately constructed forms, so different from each other, and dependent upon each other, 
in so complex a manner have been all been produced by laws that act around us still today. These laws, taken in their largest sense, being, one, growth with reproduction. Most beings are not born pregnant. They have to survive for a while to earn the right to reproduce. Earn the right to reproduce. That's a basic biological principle of Darwinism. Not everything has an equal right to survival. In fact, nothing does. Nothing has a right to survival. Second law, inheritance, which is almost implied by reproduction. That is that the child, the offspring of parents, is going to retain many of those parental traits, even combining them. You've got your father's eyes, but your mother's nose. You've got your grandfather's ears, but your grandmother's lips. You are all descendants of your parents, but you are all fusions of, different than each parent, grandparent. You are a combination, and you are a unique combination. The third law, variability from the indirect and direct actions of the conditions of life and from use and disuse, variability. That means, do you have survival traits? So children, offspring, are not the same unless they're identical twins. And even then, just because you have a set of ideas, you could have fraternal twins. It depends on how things go. But there's a variation because some of you are going to be more suited to survive than others. Let's say for a moment that cats are endangered, either because people think they're evil witch familiars sent from Satan, or because suddenly a super cat predator has arrived from off planet. Those cats that are camouflaged with their coat might survive in longer, larger numbers than to reproduce than the orange ones or the black ones or the white ones because <clears throat> they blend. They're harder to find. Here's a true story. In medieval Japan, there was a battle between two daimyos, two Japanese feudal lords, <clears throat> and two clans of samurai decided to fight. But unlike most battles, the samurai fought in a bay at sea in boats. These samurai fought and died, and one clan inevitably won, and the other clan inevitably lost. Now, you may know what samurai armor looks like, but proper samurai armor has a face mask that protects the face from certain types of attack, and it looks a certain way. Well, in the uh, months and years after the battle, there were people, fishermen, who would fish in that bay. And here's your crab, the body, the base of it. And it goes out, you've got your claws, you've got your claws, you've got your pincers in your head. But the carapaces on the backs of these crabs had variation. And some of the carapaces had this odd pattern. And this odd pattern was sort of symmetrical. And it looked like the eye holes and mouth hole of a samurai mask. Now, the Japanese at that time uh, had Buddhist influences. And because of those, they believed in reincarnation, that the soul was reborn in other forms, in other bodies. The Japanese have a very strict caste, class system at this time. If a samurai gets a new sword and wants to test its edge, if he's dry, riding along the street and there's a farmer minding his own business, the samurai can cut him in half or chop his head off. There's no problem. That's what the farmers are there for, to serve the samurai in any way the samurai want. So, there goes the head. Mmm, good sword. If the fishermen start harvesting crabs that look like the possi they are possibly reborn samurai, their entire village is going to probably get wiped out 
by the lords and the knights, the daimyos and the samurai. So the fishermen in the 1200s start throwing crabs that have this pattern back into the water. Wouldn't you know it, 800 years later or so today, eight or 900 years later, the majority of crabs along that section of Japanese coast have this pattern. Now this pattern is completely useless in nature. It's as good or bad as any other carapace pattern that's randomized on the backs of crabs. But because of us, it becomes a survival trait. The variability of the offspring can produce a greater or lesser degree of survival. This is where mutation comes in. So when Darwin says that the first law is growth with reproduction, you've got to survive to reproduce, earn the right to reproduce, that you inherit in second law traits from your parents, but that variability, third law, from the indirect and direct actions of the conditions of life and from use and disuse, we're talking about these crabs, which suddenly have a greater chance of survival if they happen to have that particular pattern on their backs. Capiche? Do you understand? This is evolution. Okay. Fourth law. A ratio of increase so high, that is, you have more kids than you need because there's going to be some dying, that's going to lead to, that's the fourth law, ratio of increase, you have more kids than you need, that's going to lead to... Fifth law, a struggle for life. We think nature's peaceful because we're at the top of the ladder. We go into these woods, we got to worry about the grizzlies and the panthers, but or not the panthers, the mountain lions. But other than that, and some poison snakes, human beings are relatively safe in nature, especially if they go armed, which you should go if you're going deep into nature. You should be able to protect yourself from a mountain lion or a grizzly if you need to. My opinion, you can certainly disagree. Out in the hills to our east, in that vast tract of wilderness Idaho, is the most brutal, pitiless struggle that we could possibly want to know. It's not like human war where you surrender, where you get to live after losing and serve the victor. No. It's kill or be killed, eat or be eaten. An absolutely merciless struggle for survival that exists out there. If you're a mouse, everything wants to eat you. If you're a badger, you, there's a reason why you're fierce. If you're an apex predator like a, a, a mountain lion, you've got to eat. And you've got to feed your, your, your kittens if you, if you have them. So the struggle for survival is part and parcel of life. And as a consequence of that struggle, we have the sixth law. Natural, as a consequence to natural selection, that means survival of the fittest. That's what natural selection means. Whether it's the fittest by having that carapace pattern, or whether it's the fittest by being better camouflaged, or whether it's the fittest by having a mutation that helps you relative to the others, you are in conflict, and it is survival of the fittest. And that is, the, that is natural selection. Entailing, seventh law, a divergence of character. More crabs reproduce that have that pattern than don't. That pattern ends up dominating. There's a divergence from the ancestry. And eighth law, from the extinction of less improved forms. Just like bankruptcy is a part of business, just like getting fired is a part of employment. Just like earning an F from time to time is a part of being a student. Losing a game is part of being an athlete. Going extinct is natural. There are some environmentalists that want to preserve all forms of life. No, that's not what nature does. By the way, eventually, unless we go out into space, our time will come. It's inevitable. Whether disease kills us, or we kill ourselves, or an asteroid whams us, or any number of things. If we go into space, we have a chance to continue our evolution. If we don't, we've over-specialized. And sooner or later, the world is going to strike back. 
and then it'll be the time for the cockroaches or or the octopi or whatever is next in the biological order assuming that we leave the planet intact enough for that so there's a divergence of character there's the extinction of less adapted forms these are the laws growth reproduction inheritance variability a ratio of increase, a struggle for life, natural selection, divergence of character, the extinction of less improved forms. Thus, from the war of nature, from famine and from death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of the higher animals, especially us, directly follows. We come from the survivors of three million years of human history, whose ancestors came from the survivors of 3.8 billion years of life, struggling to survive enough to breed and keep those kids alive so that they can breed, maybe. We are not peaceful. We are not in a placid state of equilibrium. Darwin's world is a world of kill or be killed, eat or be eaten, thrive or go extinct. No mercy. There is a grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers having been originally breathed by the Creator into a few forms or into one. Yes, Charles Darwin in The Origin of Species references God as the original cause of life. And that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed laws of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, more, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. So there's Darwin. I've explained it as I went through. You'll be expected to understand it. And you'll be expected to understand that it's our society's myth. Please close the curtains, shut the lights off, and over here too. Please. The last of the myths, you will be having a quiz on these tomorrow, is from J.R.R. Tolkien's Silmarillion, the Ainu Lindale which is his creation myth for middle Earth. Should be enough time. If you can't see, feel free to move. And since this is probably copyrighted, have a good day.